Welcome to 21st Century Radio. I'm Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. Laura Kortner is our executive producer and Anita Brockington, our engineer. Joining us this portion of the program is Paul Rademacher. Paul is the executive director of the Monroe Institute in Faber, Virginia. The Institute was founded by Robert Monroe, and you know that it's a world-renowned organization for its pioneering work in the exploration of human consciousness. They use patented auditory technology in order to help people in six-day and weekend programs experience profound states of, quote, realization and expanded awareness, unquote. Paul, as he tells in his wonderful autobiography, A Spiritual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, Travel Tips for the Spiritually Perplexed, that indeed... He has had an interesting life himself, and that's what we're going to discuss. He became interested in consciousness from an experience he had in 1980. That was followed by 15 years as a Presbyterian pastor. Before that, a building contractor, a journeyman carpenter, and among other things, a public speaker. Welcome to our program, Paul. Thank you. It's so great to be with you. I loved your book. You know, actually, I picked this book up a few years ago because the publishers are always sending us books, and I seldom do that unless I'm going to interview someone. And I was so taken with it, read it, and then picked it up again. I had read all till the last bit until recently. And I just think, you know, there's the genre of spiritual autobiography is not an easy genre to do well in. And I think you've just done a great job. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. So, having said that, let's show us, let's show the audience from what I experienced as a reader, your life really does have very particular stages, and each seems to have added to the one before. So tell us about the Paul Rademacher before he went to Princeton Theological Seminary. <laughs> yeah, it's been, a, it's been a strange and twisted journey, that's for sure. Um, probably the, one of the, the peak moments that happened in my life was in my um, late twenties, my brother and I had a construction company, and uh, I was—we were building a home, and I was working up on the roof and pulling on a board. And all of a sudden, the board gave way, and I found myself careening off the roof and wasn't able to adjust for the fall, and ended up, ended up fracturing my left hip. When they took me to the hospital, they did some X-rays, and first they didn't find anything wrong with the hip, and so they put me into physical therapy, which was excruciating because they were making sure it was good and loose and crank, cranking it around and everything. Finally, the doctor came by and he said, you know, you don't look like you're doing too well. And I said, no, I'm really not, doc. He said, well, let's take some more x-rays of that hip. And that's when they found that it was actually fractured, and they took me out of physical therapy and put me into traction. And when he came to tell me that I was uh, going to be off work for a considerable uh, amount of time after he left, I found myself spiraling downward and it, was, it wasn't really even a metaphor. It was an actual feeling. I could feel myself spiraling. And as I was going down, there was a spiral of pain and anxiety, pain because the hip was excruciating and anxiety because this was the busiest time of our construction year and there was no way I could possibly be off work. As I was going down, all of a sudden, I felt like I broke through something. And to this day, I don't even know what that something was. And I found myself in a completely different reality. Now, mind you, I was just an ordinary contractor. I hadn't done a lot of ex spiritual exploration or anything like that. All of a sudden, I found myself in a world where the pain completely vanished. The anxiety went away, and I found myself surrounded by total peace and complete love. And I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that there were no such things as accidents. Everything had meaning and purpose and was exactly the way it should be, including this apparent accident. And then at one point, and I say at one point because time gets very distorted when you move into these different uh, kinds of experiences, I found myself talking to a being of light that I still don't know the name of this being of light, but... Somehow we were conversing about my life and, and not using words, but it was more of a telepathic uh, communication. And when I came out of that experience, I was completely blown away by it because, again, I, this was something that was utterly new to me. I, and if it was possible, it certainly wasn't possible for a guy like me, just an ordinary contractor. And yet here I was uh, experiencing this most profound event in my life, and it really changed the course of my life from that point on. 
I can only imagine. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> unlike for myself, I've always had weird stuff even since the age of three, and I can remember progressively how weirder it got. <laughs> if that's, yeah. what, I don't think that's exactly great English, but you got it. And yeah, and exactly. I would imagine, but but we hear more and more accounts because we, I guess, because on our program we focus on these things mm-hmm. of people whose lives are profoundly changed in an unex- unexpected moment where they actually do arrive at a new state of awareness that forever changes the paradigm that they had before. That's right. So I love the stories you tell about how this then led to your thinking that you should probably go into the ministry and the signs. I I just love that whole section where you and your wife decide, well, the only way you can make a commitment as drastic as this is to wait for signs. But why did the ministry occur to you as a step that this would lead to? Well, that was one of those strange things. You know, people talk about having a calling into the ministry or maybe a calling into any kind of vocation as far as that goes. But I do remember one point uh, that was particularly compelling for me. I, I, my wife and I were, were part of a church and found myself uh, teaching a Sunday school class, and all of a sudden I heard this sort of interior voice saying, this is what I want you to do. And I kind of knew right away that this was the voice was talking about the ministry, and uh, but I didn't know quite what to do with that. You know, it's not every day that a voice just kind of appears in your head, but it was a very compelling thing. And uh, afterwards, my wife and I and, and our children were going to go over to the associate pastor's house. And on the way, I, I turned to my wife, Jackie, and I said, Jackie, what were you to say? What would you say if I was to go into the ministry? And I knew there was no way she was ever going to agree to that. It was just a crazy idea. But it really knocked my socks off because she didn't even blink, and she said, yeah, let's do it, let's go, just like that. And then when we got over to the pastor's house, my wife, we're eating dinner, and she says, well, are you going to tell them? And the pastor's wife says, what, you're going into the ministry. So it was some really key things that happened in very rapid succession within a couple of hours, but really it wasn't enough to convince me I needed something much more compelling than that. And, of course, it must have taken a broken hip for the to finally get to me. Well, and when you, it's so interesting because when we start to look at our life in the reverse chronology, sometimes it gives us a lot more insight than when we're living it in the progressive fashion that our life takes. But because right. you are sort of a journeyer of the multidimensionality, you also write very beautifully, as you've already described in your hospital experience, that there are places of being that are not about bounded time, as we know from getting up and going to sleep each day. Right. Right. In fact, you know, uh, the work that we do at the Institute um, has convinced me through the years that our whole conception of time is pretty pretty distorted, and it's, it's pretty much of an illusion. It's, it's mm-hmm. kind of a cultural paradigm that we all have agreed that, that time moves from the past through to the future, and it's got a chronology to it that's tied to the wristwatch that we carry around. But really, that's... Um, Time is much more fluid than that, and I think our own experience bears that out. I mean, there's a big difference in, in time uh, if you're sitting in a dentist's chair versus the time when you're in love with somebody and, and, the, and you know, you're a kid and, you know, you, the time is ticking down and the curfew is going to come. Time just seems like it speeds by. So even within our own experience, we have these varying um, perspectives on time. But that gets radically changed when we move in, into non-physical dimensions. And we've spent so much time over the last 20-plus years on our program looking at all things related to non-local consciousness. So our audience has had a really good exposure to these potentials. I love the way Ingo Swan used to talk about them as our bio-mind superpowers. And don't expect, <laughs> don't expect any billboard or government school advertising these things. And I think that's the same thing with time. It's like, how could a society of humans accept being workers if we don't buy into the framework of time? Mm-hmm. Meaning there's a whole lot of political constructs that go on top of it that allow people to go into debt and to think that you need this and that when when I think most of the holy traditions teach us that the thing we need most is a closeness with God or with divinity or divine providence, give it whatever right. name you want. So I'm kind of interested in the way in which be, as a Presbyterian minister for 15 years or a pastor, I guess is the right term, how, how does that whole construct fit in with 
with your experience at the Monroe Institute and the work that you all do, which certainly goes way beyond any religion and any kind of construct of belief. Well, I, 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 let me throw out a caveat here you know, to begin with. Um, first off, one of the things I, I want your listeners to understand is that at the Monroe Institute, we do not have any dogma. We try to stay very, very neutral in terms of what we do so that it's uh, so that people from all walks of life and from all different religious uh, and cultural perspectives can come and engage the experience that we have if we do have one piece of dogma it's that we simply ask people to consider the possibility that they might be more than their physical bodies we don't try to tell them what that more might be we just want them to uh, engage in the experiences so that they can find out for themselves So. That's one hat that I wear that I think it's very important for people to understand that. The other hat that I wear is the author of this book. And this is my own personal journey where I'm trying to put together these two worlds. One, the world that I experience in the Monroe Institute, and the other world, which I think is the underpinnings of virtually every religious tradition. And for me, the, the bridge between those two is the mystical experience. When you look at uh, the, the, chron- the chronology and the texts of, of virtually any religion, you'll find somebody uh, there who has had an experience that transcends the ordinary world in some way. In the Jewish tradition, you have Moses in front of the burning bush. You have Abraham who hears a call from God to move from one place to another. Ezekiel who has a strange visions of wheels within wheels. But uh, within uh, you know, the Christian tradition, you have Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration and Paul on the road to Damascus. And, and it, it goes uh, into the Hindu tradition when Arjuna uh, sees the divine form of Krishna, and on and on and on. So each of these, somebody has moved from ordinary reality to begin to explore, experience something that goes beyond our normal way of, of uh, talking about these things problem we run into is the language that we have. Exactly. That is really true. can't capture the transcendent experience at all. It's very true. And, and because each tradition has its own set of framework terminology, you really, you know, my expression within the Kabbalistic um, teachings of revelation will be different from a Christian expression of revelation, but we're probably both pointing to the same state of divine consciousness. Mm-hmm. But we can't talk yeah. about it unless you experience it. That's, that's the problem. It, it, it has to be experienced because all of our words are about the physical reality. So they're tied to descriptions of, of the mundane world, and they simply, the best we can do is to use metaphors or um, analogies, and people don't often realize that that's what's happening. And so when they read the, the sacred texts, they take it literally. Mm-hmm. thinking that it's the words that are the key, when it's really the, the fact that the, the words point to some other reality, some other experience that transcends this world. I agree with you entirely. Well, look, we're going to take our first break, and then we'll be back. And I'd, I'd like to look at the way in which the work at the Monroe Institute lets a person have this experience, because I think you're right, and I I think all the traditions point to the same thing. We can't buy an entry ticket to certain levels of consciousness, and you can't borrow it from somebody else. So it's how do we condition the field, so to speak, or cultivate an opportunity to have these experiences, And, and that is really what's so extraordinary about the Monroe Institute. Don't go away. We'll be right back on 21st Century Radio with our guest, Paul Rodemaker, who is the executive director of the Monroe Institute, and you can Find them online at www.monroeinstitute.org. Hello, this is Jim Tucker. I'm a child psychiatrist and I'm the author of Return to Life. Extraordinary Cases of Children Who Remember Past Lives. You can learn more about it at www.jimbtucker.com. You are listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zahara Hirata. 
Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. I'm Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. Our guest, Paul Rademacher's wonderful Hampton Roads release, A Spiritual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, Travel Tips for the Spiritually Perplexed. So, Paul, I realize in, in during the break that we could have easily talked for two hours, one hour on your book and one hour on the Monroe Institute. So can we kind of like cross back and forth between them? Absolutely. I'm I'm well accustomed to doing that. All right. Well, that's what we're going to try to do then, because I think that your life is such a beautiful testimony to what the Monroe Institute has accomplished for so many thousands of people. In fact, Frank DeMarco was recently with us and he talked about it. In fact, he's the one that said, oh, yeah, you got to call Paul. So so we (laughs) have. Have. One of the things we share in common is Dr. Raymond Moody's wonderful Life After Life and Far Journeys. Share with us how his work influenced you. Well, it, pretty dramatically, uh, in the early part of my career as a pastor, one of the things that was very, very difficult to get accustomed to was this whole um, prospect of walking into somebody's room who's in the process of dying or very, very ill. And um, it wasn't until I read that book that I began to realize that there actually was something to this idea of life beyond, beyond life. And it was a great uh, deal of comfort for me. And so I began to uh, be able to incorporate that more and more into my discussions with people and talk very openly with, with them about this whole issue of, of death and dying. You know, it's really interesting in our culture that, that – we have this taboo against talking about death. And if you uh, are around somebody who's dying, it's very interesting to watch family members and even doctors and nurses, how everybody wants to skirt around the issue. You know, the, the friends will come in and say, oh, don't be sad. You're going to be great. You know, we'll be up in the golf course in a couple days. You know, can't wait to get out there with you and on and on. But when uh, everybody leaves, it's very interesting how people start to open up about this whole question of death you've got to realize this is the most important thing on their agenda. And so uh, when they start to talk openly about it, it's a very, very compelling thing because people get very real about their lives and, and the things that are of highest priority for them. And so that was, it was Raymond Moody's work that, that gave that a, sort of a concrete setting for me in a lot of ways that gave it grounding and, and helped, gave me a lot of confidence. But it's actually the work at the Monroe Institute that augmented that in a, in a big way because I began to uh, actually on several occasions had encounters with my father who had uh, died of Alzheimer's disease. And that was really a, 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 something that changed my perspective pretty dramatically. Those were beautiful stories. Would you share those? Oh, sure. Um, as I mentioned, my father died of Alzheimer's, and he died in 1992. And I was able to be at his bedside the night that he, he had passed away. Now, by this point in time, he was not um, able to recognize us most of the time, but every once in a while there would be a little glimmer of awareness. He wasn't talking, um, and something compelled me to lean over to him. And I said, Dad, listen, when you get to the other side, will you come back and, and tell me what it's all about? And, and he just kind of nodded a very little bit, so I was hoping that maybe he would do it. Well, seven years later, I was at the Monroe Institute, and we were, we were doing a, a one exercise, and I can't remember exactly what the exercise was, but I'm moving through this other dimension that is not of space and time. And I say moving through because there was just a sense of, of uh, speed or... Mm-hmm travel or something like that, all of a sudden I found myself looking at a a circle of people who were made of light. And when I came over, I thought, well, gee, that's interesting. You don't see people made of light every day. So I went over to the circle and I peered over somebody's shoulder. And there was this person who obviously had just come over from the other side, from passing through death. And I looked down and suddenly realized it was my father who had died seven years prior. And something instinctive took over, and the, the circle kind of parted, and, and I picked him up in my arms, and by this time he was totally exhausted. And the, most, the best analogy I can have, have is that it was like a, um, a fish that had been uh, fighting on a line and was now landed in the bottom of the boat and just kind of uh, thoroughly exhausted. That was the way my father kind of felt and looked. And I told him, I said, Dad, your family's going to come after a while, and 
you can expect this and this as if I had any <laughs> authority. Uh, but it felt right. And then after a while, one of the beings of light came and took him from me. And, uh, and he said, you've done a great job. And, and you, your, his family is coming. And uh, he's going to be fine. And so they took my father away. And then I came out of the experience, and I was I was so overwhelmed. The only way I could even begin to um, deal with it was just to uh, shed tears of, of, of unending, just flowing, and just bawling my eyes out because it was so profound for me. When people listen to you tell the story, or when I share, or some other guest shares their story, I'm sure there's some who are thinking, "Boy, these guys have a great imagination. They have some sort of fantasy world going on here." Right. Right, and and I right. think this is, a, and I bring this up with every guest when we talk about these kinds of interdimensional realities. And, and for me, they're as real as having a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I'm not quite sure why that just came to mind, but I must need one <laughs> <laughs> right about now. <laughs> Sounds like a pretty good dessert, actually. <laughs> just fine for us from your experience, because people sure. always say to me, well, you all talk about all these invisible beings that you encounter and these amazing things that happen to you. And how do you know it's just not lo- just a long psychological story sure. that your own mind is putting together? So in your case, can be at rest with your father having passed on. Right. Uh, for me, I think that there, there are some pretty key markers along the way. One of those markers is, um, has, is the experience something that is beyond your imagination. In other words, you couldn't have made it up if you tried. And when that happens, that, that tends to be an indication that there's something here that is beyond your imagination because it, it is something that uh, you didn't craft, or at least not consciously. So that, that's one uh, key indicator for me. Another is that if you gain some information that can later be confirmed through some other source, that's an important marker as well. To give you an example of that, we had somebody who went through the Institute, and when he was going through an experience, he found himself in a d- domain where he encountered the deceased wife of one of his good friends. This, uh, but as he, he recognized her immediately, but she had on a dress that he had never seen. It was a very, very distinctive dress, kind of a polka dot thing, and it had a very distinctive belt to it that was wider on one side than on the other. And when he came back uh, from, from the Institute, he saw his friend, and they had a conversation, and he didn't quite know how to bring it up, but he finally did. He says, you know, I, I saw your wife, and, and his friend was, oh, really? Tell me about it. And he went on to describe the dress and, and the belt that he saw, and his friend said, well, oh, that was her m- most favorite dress. In fact, they were over at his house, and he said, let me show you a picture of it, and it was exactly the same dress that he saw. So that's a pretty... Uh, big piece of confirmation there. I think another marker is is that if you meet somebody else who uh, ends up in the same place as you do and confirm the ex- can confirm the experience that you've had in common. I know that happened to me at the Monroe Institute in my first program there. Um, I ended up in this place that I can only call the City of Light. And one of the things we do is you go into the experience and then you have the opportunity to come back and talk about that as a group if you want to. And the first person um, that began to talk talked about going to this place that she called a city of light. And she described many of the things that I saw there, and I was, that was amazing to me. And I thought, I wonder if everybody else has had this experience, but nobody else mentioned it. And after a while, I finally raised my hand, and I said, well, you know, I went to the city of light, too. And the woman across the room from me said, I know, I saw you there. There's, well, there's you stories, know, you know, of, of meditators who bump into each other in that meditative state out there in the astral plane or causal plane and then meet each other sometime or other in their life and go, oh, yeah, I remember you. (laughs) What all the mystery traditions have been about is to make us aware of our divinity, which requires that we experience that we are an immortal soul inside a body and the body's the vessel, but our senses, our eyes and our ears, you know, these are, these are aptitudes of the soul and the body. So one of the things I've, I've, I've said to younger people is, you know, in the same way you're going to meet somebody when you go downtown tomorrow, it's really no different in these other planes. But they always ask me, well, how do you know that somebody who you meet in these other planes is good or bad? Mm -hmm. How would you answer that? Well, I think our conceptions of of good and evil are, are 
very skewed by uh, the perspectives that we have within our, our bodies, that when uh, you're able to move beyond the confines of the physical world and physical experience, then everything takes on a very, very different context. So that the very things that, that sometimes cause us the most pain we can look at as being a tremendously valuable lessons. I, I think in, in my own life of, of one experience in particular, when I went, went to uh, college the first time around, I was with two other roommates, and, and one of the roommates and I absolutely did not get along. I mean, we fought constantly. He was the biggest pain in the butt that I could possibly imagine. To make matters worse, the third roommate just loved to watch us fight, so he was always instigating things. But after I graduated from college, I began to realize that this other roommate was holding up a mirror for me in a lot of ways that I had, hadn't paid attention to before. And as painful as it, as it was, he was actually one of the best teachers I've ever had because he showed me my blind spots and at least uh, some of the more egregious ones. And I began to realize that uh, what, what apparently is good and evil in this world is, is very, very different when viewed from the perspective of the education of the soul. That's definitely so, and I think all the sacred traditions teach that everybody is a teacher and every day is a lesson. So it's what it's how we respond, I, I guess, would be the easiest way to put it, not what it is. Mm-hmm. And that in, in Kabbalah, anyway, in the Hasidic tradition, they're always talking about revealed good and concealed good. And revealed good is when things are happy and we're doing great and we feel great and everybody's well and You know, you just couldn't ask for more. And then all of a sudden something happens. One of the children or a grandchild is ill or something happens at work or you lose your job. And that's concealed good. But the concealed good is the greater good, meaning it's a more brilliant light because it's hidden. So when we find the good in things we might otherwise experience as suffering or pain, as your own experience pointed out, you can break through to a whole other divinity that's held in that experience. Well, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the, the fellow who wrote the Gulag Archipelago, had a, has a great saying about that. He says that the dividing line between good and evil cuts through every human heart. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? I think that's really important for us to understand that this sense of individuality and separation that we have is quite an illusion. And that we're really connected with people in many, many different ways. And the people that we think maybe are the the worst or the most evil people are actually acting out for us in many ways some of the things that are in our own heart. And that's a very very difficult lesson to learn, but I think it's very true. So at the Monroe Institute, when people come because they're looking to experience some part of consciousness, some part of life that maybe they've tapped into at some point, Maybe they haven't. Describe for us what a visitor will experience, what the journey is like in your weekend workshops or in the more the longer six-day intensive. Well, the um, it's different for everybody, and, what, what, and that's what's so interesting and unique about this work. We learned a long time ago that uh, if there's one place where we need to trust the process, it's at the Monroe Institute because everybody brings their own guidance and their own needs that they ha- they may or may not be conscious of. And so what we do is simply create a context to allow things to unfold in the best possible way for each person. The way that we do that is that Robert Monroe, uh, a number of years ago, uh, began experimenting with sound to see if there was some way that sound could be used to induce altered states of awareness. In the process, he developed a series of sound patterns that he called hemisync, and th- these sound patterns help to balance the left and the right uh, hemispheres of the brain. But they also open, open up a doorway to begin to experience for yourself, not through somebody else's stories or somebody else's authority, but for yourself, the experience of moving beyond the confines of our normal physical reality. So in the process, he kind of developed a map of consciousness. And and what we do in the Monroe Institute is to take people to these different destination points in this map of consciousness. So uh, in in a week-long program, we would take you to four different destination points that are specific uh, states of awareness for people. When when people talk about near-death experiences or they talk about in-between life experience and that they encounter guides, and you describe something like that in your book regarding your father and in some other 
situations. Who are these guides? <laughs> That's the $64,000 question. <laughs> because everybody that has the experience will have a different uh, explanation for that. You know, sometimes it can be um, guides who we've made contracts with before we came into this world. Sometimes it can be aspects of ourselves that have, we have disowned. Sometimes it can be um, what some people might call sort of a committee or a group of people who act as uh, guides uh, and sort of manipulate uh, our experience to some extent and help us to ensure that we learn the things that we're, we want to learn. Sometimes they can be angels, you, you name it. But the names are not really as critical as the direct personal experience of it. And, and, and that kind of relegates the names to being inconsequential once that happens. I like that. That just makes it all so simple. Well, look, we're going to take, <laughs> take a break on that very simple moment. Our guest, if you've just joined us, is Paul Rademacher. We're talking about, in addition to his book, A Spiritual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, a Hampton Roads 2009 release, we're talking about the Monroe Institute, Triple W dot Monroe, M-O-N-R-O-E, Institute dot org. On the next 21st Century Radio, Tim Beckley will join us to talk about subterranean worlds inside the Earth. Sunday night at 8, 21st Century Radio, Talk Radio 680 WCBM. Hi, this is Dr. Bernie Siegel speaking to you for 21st Century Radio, Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. She's top quality, as is her program, speaking about consciousness and opening our minds to what I think will be the future of both medical care as well as how we care for ourselves and each other and really begin to understand ourselves. My latest book is The Art of Healing. Bless you all. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. I'm Zoe Hieronymus, and our guest is Paul Rademacher. Paul's the executive director of the Monroe Institute and author of a wonderful book. If you like spiritual autobiographies, it's great. A Spiritual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. It's a Hampton Road release. Paul, one of the things that, um, one of the things that you write about is coming out of, quote, unquote, the mystical closet. And I very recently, just really in the last year, sort of came out of the medium's closet, where, where I have always been. But have never really made a public, you know, admission of it. How did that affect your life? That that was really tough because I don't know that if you can imagine a more difficult place to be a closet mystic than than to be a Presbyterian pastor. You know, uh, we always called ourselves the Frozen Chosen. <laughs> <laughs> It was everything in the Presbyterian Church is done decently and in order, and so and there was nothing decent or orderly about any of the experiences that I was having, and uh, but the problem was I, I was so compelled to have to pursue this because you know Jesus used uh, some parables about the kingdom of heaven. He would talk about one of them, uh, merchants in search of a fine pearl, and he finds one of great value, and he goes and sells everything that he has in order to buy that pearl. When I fell off of the roof and had some subsequent uh, mystical experiences, for me, this was invaluable. I literally would have sold everything that I had in order to be able to touch into that world again. But, you know, I, I, can't, you know, I think that the, the universe has a very sick sense of humor than to, to place me in an, an environment where that was so very, very difficult to do. Because as a Presbyterian pastor, you know, your, your time is taken up with everything but that, you know, committee meetings, preaching, teaching, visiting the sick, and administration, and on and on and on. And uh, so it was very, very difficult for me. And so the best I could do was, you know, one of the things that we get uh, used to get as when I was a pastor was something called study leave. And so I would sneak off to these conferences and seminars that I would never tell any of my parishioners about, but it was something that I desperately needed in order to, to feed my soul. I was literally dying on the vine because uh, there was something that was so vital to me and I could not connect with it. One of the things, though, once I went to the Monroe Institute, it actually got much worse because this tension between where I was and where I wanted to be was so strong. 
and and yet I also had a wife and three children, and it was the classic spiritual struggle of you know well I got to make a living here, and if I leave the ministry, then what do I do? You know I just I didn't know what to do. And so when I went to the Monroe Institute and, and found a way of connecting into these other worlds, these mystical worlds, it was so profound yet um, even much more difficult. Eventually, though, I decided to take a big risk, and I actually did a couple of seminars for some people in my church where I used some of the Monroe Institute exercises and did a weekend with them and helped them to see how this connects into this sort of hidden mystical tradition within our own tradition. And boy, when it, it was like manna from heaven for them because mm-hmm. it opened their eyes up. And as one guy said, you know, I've been searching for this all my life, but I didn't even know what it was until this weekend. And, and that so, was sort of what, what I'd like to point to in our discussion mm-hmm. because for myself also, I was always into everything alternative, everything off this world or out of this world or in this world or something. And, and then was called back... Um, to study the Jewish tradition, even though I had left it and d- did the 10,000 things. And I think there are a lot of us as souls incarnate right now who are trying to bring the mystical experience that is in all these wonderful monotheistic faiths that have been lost in the system of the religion and the culture of it. But the mystical tradition is the heart of all of it. I agree. Uh, there's no question about it. And I think we are being called back to that. Um, and and once you hear that calling, you, there's just simply no way to turn away from it for very long. You can do it for a while, but eventually the the the, the separation between your present state and where you need to be is is kind of painful. The the challenge, I mean, speaking for myself, because I was covering politics and doing everything of the new paradigm and religion, to me was the furthest thing that I would ever consider investigating. And then I got the call and became an Orthodox woman. It didn't last for long. I mean, it was six intense years of, and I still live a kosher kitchen and, you know, and I celebrate the Sabbath and I honor the holidays, but, but it was... You can ask my husband. He basically just held on for dear life. God bless him for knowing that this was a spiritual calling. But when somebody has a spiritual calling, you have no choice but to follow it. Uh, Yes, I I think you do have a choice for a while, you know, but uh, part of that choice is to create a a pain that... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they won't let you go in any other direction. Well, right? exactly. So so now, though, you've gone through an interesting journey of really studying your faith and, and learning about the teachers of Jesus, Jesus and then being as you are so involved in the Monroe Institute and the thousands of people that benefit by it. How have you been able to balance sometimes what the tradition says, like what does Christianity traditionally within the Presbyterian practice really say about reincarnation versus what you experience and know? Oh, okay. Um, that's been a long journey, to be honest with you. And and for me, uh, this this balance with the tradition comes back to this question of experience. And I th- again, I think it's the experience that's at the at the beginning of all the traditions, and, and when we connect back into that experience, we're getting to the essence of what the tra- tradition is about. Mm-hmm. But as far as the, the reincarnation question, that's that's a really kind of a ticklish one, because I know in, in uh, much of Christianity uh, there is this idea that that's a heresy and so on and so forth. Um, but there are evidences of reincarnation even within the biblical tradition. You know, this idea that Elijah would come back before Jesus uh, appeared or the Messiah would appear. Um, this uh, idea that Jesus and his disciples would, would encounter some dead people or that Jesus would appear to Paul. Um, but even what's more interesting than that to me is that we take certain concepts for granted when we talk about reincarnation. For me, there are bigger questions like, one of those is, who are we? You know, what is what is this thing that it might or might not be reincarnated? When you start to move into these kinds of experiences, you realize that the uh, the separation that we feel from our between ourselves and the world, or between ourselves and other people, isn't as hard and fast as what we think. Mm-hmm. In fact, we share uh, a lot more in common than than what separates us. And when you move into these mystical realms and you encounter other parts of yourself, uh, 
then you begin to wonder, well, wait a minute, am I all of these or am I just this earthly part that's living right now? The other big issue that relates to this is, uh, we talked about it before, this concept of time. Uh, reincarnation, in the usual sense, is based on this idea of chronological time. But when, you know, I, I work with a very interesting guy by the name of Skip Atwater who worked We know in Skip. Re- I've interviewed Skip. Uh-huh. Yeah. The, he, he created the remote viewing program for the military. And one of the things he always says to me is, Paul, you know, information travels both backwards and forwards in time. Oh, yeah. Okay. So wrap your head around that one for a second and see if you come away with the same conception of time that you had before. Exactly. I mean, I love that you have this one sentence in your book I highlighted. If everything is now, is there anything such as a past life? <laughs> exactly. I mean, and, and it was interesting because Frank DeMarco and I were talking about that, as Dr. Bob has with other guests, is that if we are multidimensional and if this linear notion of time is is an illusion that we create to sort of give us ourselves bearing, like gravity for the mind. That's how I think of it, sort of a gravitas of the mind, right. is that my other experiences in other time periods are here now. Like today, I was thinking, so I wonder which one of my gang of me isn't so crazy about making dinners? <laughs> and which part of my gang of me just loves the mystical? Or which part of the gang of me is still really that young athlete, even though I'm not her? And and so I, I really, and I have found this since these conversations more recently, and once you can open your heart up to that, the mind doesn't seem to have as much trouble with it. I mean, it's almost like for the heart, it's 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 natural to be everywhere and every when. Yes, exactly. And But, you know, we don't have to get too terribly esoteric about this. Even in your ordinary, everyday life, we all have moments of remembering a past event. And if it was something that was heart-rending to us and we have that memory of it, we can re-experience it almost as if we were in the original event itself. Right. So even in our ordinary life, we have this ability to transcend time. Uh, we can go back and forth in time, and we can even project into the future and imagine what a meeting is going to be like. And there are times, and I know I've had it in my life, where that um, projection into the future is so strong that it actually you end up actually duplicating it later on in your life, and you go, oh, gee, I must have seen the future there somehow. How interesting is that? What are the, I love to ask this of people like yourself who are who are really helping facilitate this wonderful journey for other people. Are there big questions you're still asking? Is there anything you're, like, trying to experience that you haven't? Oh, boy. Um. You know, one, I think one of the big big issues for me has been down through the years is why can't I access these states on a more consistent basis? And, you know, I have all kinds of um, – Frank DeMarco calls them the, the guys upstairs. Right. I have all kinds of conversations with them around this. And uh, what I think what I've come away with is that these these other dimensions are so alluring and so wonderful that if I was to – it spend too much time there, I probably wouldn't have the focus that I need to do what I need to uh, do on this in this earthly existence. Because, you know, I, I hear people all the time who say things like, oh, I'm going to make sure this is my last time around. I am not coming back to this earth again. Well, that kind of misses the point that, that we are here for a very profound reason, and that's some, uh, the education and the nurture of the soul. We're gaining something in this experience that is literally priceless. And so I, I think that uh, over the years I've, I've gained more and more peace with that question. And what's interesting is that it has allowed me to be more present to this world and to see that there's a magical aspect to this existence right now if we open our eyes to it. I, I have found the exact same thing, so it must be the beauty of age. You know, <laughs> that, you know that after the wild-eyed soul goes, you know, journeying forth and flying around. And I actually found at one point in my life I did so much of that out-of-body travel and so much of that sort of other kind of communication with, quote-unquote, the guys upstairs, that it was really painful to be in a body. And I would exactly. weep about it. And then and fortunately, thank God, that I moved through that phase by doing very specific work. But I, I think that it's true, that it's, it's part of the journey. And then we're blessed 
to integrate that into our daily living. And hopefully it changes how we are and what we think and what we say and how we do what we do. Yeah, so to answer your question, I, I, I feel like at this, at this point in my life, and I think age does have a lot to do with it, I, I'm probably, this is the most content I've ever been in my life simply because I've sort of made peace with being mm-hmm. as it is right now. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm not driven by the same questions that I used to be. Um, I'm sort of still very, very curious about just about everything, mm-hmm. but uh, it's, it doesn't have the pain wrapped around it that I used to. I agree entirely. Isn't it good to have done all that hard work? <laughs> so you actually get to, the other day I'm thinking, I can do anything in the world. What do I want to do? And the answer is I want to do what I'm doing. <laughs> so, yeah, that's contentment's a blessing. People think, how can you be content with the world the way it is? Because you learn to have peace in your heart. So, Paul, thank you so much for being with us. We look forward to yeah, being with pleasure. you again. Paul Rademacher, you can get his book, A Spiritual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, Travel Tips for the Spiritually Perplexed, and you can and find links to his on our website, www.21stCenturyRadio.com. 